can help um, by, I, I find it hard. I mean, sometimes it's hard if you are focusing on questions to get everything in the chat. Um, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it can help. Great, thank you. Feed you questions. Okay, I started the live stream, so I'm just gonna turn off my mic or my camera and I will let everyone know with one minute to go. Okay, everybody, um, everyone is here, everyone is ready to go. Okay, Ricardo, you're pinned and we'll pin uh, Karen when it's time for her introduction and then uh, we'll hand it over to our speaker, okay? I'm gonna start the recording. Ricardo, you're muted and just wait until wait until 12 and then wait another 15 seconds for everyone to join from the waiting room, okay? We're not started yet. Great. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Knowledge Cafe here at the School of Cities. I hope everyone has had an incredible start to their new year, and I would just like to thank you all for attending and joining us here for our first session back for the 2022 year. My name is Ricardo Lopez, and I am very excited and honored to be hosting today's session, which is Social Housing Lessons from the United States and Canada with Professor Prentice Dantzler. Before we introduce Professor Dantzler and get into our presentation for the day, I would just like to take a moment to begin today's meeting with a land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful and acknowledge our privilege in having the opportunity to work on this land. Thank you. Some quick reminders about today's session I would like to run over with you all. Our meeting today is being recorded as well as live streamed on our YouTube channel. And we strongly encourage you to participate by asking your questions in the chat or via YouTube at any time during our presentation and meeting today. And we have a, a, a big group with us today and a topic that I'm sure we all have a lot to say about. So we will do our absolute best uh, to address and get to everyone's questions. Additionally, live captioning is also enabled, and you can toggle that on or off using the CC button located at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, if you are posting at all about today's session on LinkedIn or Twitter, we would appreciate if you would tag us at U of T Cities. I would like to now invite our director, Professor Karen Chapel, to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ricardo, and thanks for, for being our facilitator today. Um, and thank you all for joining in what must be a very busy week for everybody with the first week of, of classes at the University of Toronto. So I'm delighted uh, that Professor Prentice Dantzler agreed to come and present uh, some of his research today. So Prentice is a, an assistant professor 
of Sociology at the St. George campus of the University of Toronto. He comes to us with several years um, already under his belt at the, as a professor at Georgia State and Colorado College in sociology also. He also had a familiarity with Toronto that he gained as a Fulbright scholar um, and uh, became very familiar with housing issues uh, in the region and started developing his comparative work at that point. Um, he has degrees in urban and regional planning, which pleases me endlessly, as well as uh, public affairs uh, from Rutgers Camden. Um, his work focuses on poverty and neighborhood change, housing and community development, um, racial capitalism, um, and many other areas. Um, we are really delighted that he agreed to become an advisor to the School of Cities, so he is um, the first member of our newly formed executive committee of leadership at the School of Cities. Um, and we're so happy that you could join us today. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you everybody for being here today. It's good to see some familiar faces and new faces as well. I'm gonna share my screen quickly so we can get right into the conversation. So we got more time for a Q and A. Right. Yes. All right. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for the great welcome. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work I've been doing um, probably since almost 10 years at this point, um, looking at public housing as a space for housing assistance, um, but really kind of thinking about the longevity for it. So I, when I originally went to graduate school, I was actually interested more in energy and environmental issues, but um, they're growing up in Philly and being in Philly at the time, there was a lot of housing issues in the city. Um, through Hope 6 and some of the other federal, US federal policies, there was a lot of redevelopment of public housing sites around, around um, the city itself. Uh, Philly is in the top five of the most housing units in public housing and still tends to be there this way. Although when I started doing this work, there was a lot more hot public housing units available. And now every year there's a fewer and fewer numbers of units as we switch to other housing assistance programs that I'll talk about. So we start here um, with uh, FDR, federal, uh, previous president. Um, and this was actually a speech that he did at the first public housing site at Techwood Homes in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, recently where I was appointed as an assistant professor in urban studies there. Um, but it also replaced one of the other kind of um, housing sites there called Techwood Flats. And if you wanna get more information from that, there's an amazing book by a colleague, Akira Rodriguez at UPenn, who looks at that history of Atlanta and their public housing and social movements that came about that. Before we get into this talk, there are some acknowledgements that I would like to make. Um, one is from the Fulbright Canada program. That was a unique opportunity for me to come up here and just spend some time in the city and this is where I really started to develop more of my comparative interest in housing um, for a number of reasons that I'll talk about and throughout the talk. Um, while I was here, I was able to develop a relationship with Erin Bradford, who's a business analyst at Toronto Community Housing Corporation. I um, mean, she has been instrumental on the data collection part um, with uh, TCHC data that would be used in the second half of this presentation. Uh, Emmeline Rents, who is one of my doctoral students at Georgia State and the Urban Studies Institute, um, she is a trained uh, GIS specialist and does some beautiful maps and we are working on some spatially doing some mapping with the data from Toronto. Um, I also received some help from some colleagues here. So Jason Hackworth and Andrew Dick in the Geography and Planning Program, um, who, is, who helped me develop some of the dissemination areas to use with that data that we were using for the TCHC data. And as, as a result, this uh, this project started being funded by Fulbright and um, it continues to be overseen by TCHC, but these viewpoints are all just my own and don't reflect positions of those funding sources of the public organizations. Um, so we start here, I'm going to focus on the U.S. first. Um, so we start here thinking about what does housing really mean to people? And part of the housing that I was really interested in is this concept of the American dream, right? So this is an ideology, ideology that's been kind of promote it to a lot of American families. And part of it is that you would strive and become more economically mobile. And one of the crux of, uh, crux of those, that mobility is by achieving home ownership. 
And this is something that's not just embedded in the way people kind of live their lives, but this is a constructed ideology dating way back into the 40s and the 50s, where the United States and federal policy were driving more housing consumption for everyday Americans. Through this approach, we know that there was a massive suburbanization of communities and cities across the country, right? So instead of living in the kind of inner cities where a lot of kind of uh, diverse communities actually did used to live, um, as there were increases of communities of color, more white families moved to the suburbs, right? And we know this just through the, 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 the countless amount of research that has seen this drastic amount of suburbanization as a result of urban sprawl. And there was a lot of kind of momentum. It wasn't just people deciding to do it. There was a lot of marketing materials that you see in this picture, um, glorifying the, the suburbs at the expense of inner cities. At the same time, around the times of the Great Depression, there was a massive influx uh, or interest in establishing some type of national housing program. So here you see Techwood Homes that I just talked about in Atlanta. Um, and this was the, the early character of public housing. It wasn't these kind of tall buildings that we see around different cities um, where they were like 10 or 20 stories. It was more planned as a short, low rise um, housing developments that where you had community spaces, you had public spaces within these units. Um, as you can see, though, that every kind of public housing site or a lot of the public housing sites that we talk about are not there anymore, or if they are, their character has starkly changed. So while Techwood Homes is no longer there, this has been replaced by a lot of the redevelopment around Georgia Tech's campus. Um, and even the, the state of uh, public housing in the, in the city of Atlanta tends to be null and void, right? So we've drastically shifted away from thinking about public housing as a viable site. And there's a lot of contentions on why there, there is. When we look around the United States, there's different case studies that a lot of kind of urban scholars have looked at to tease out why this has been an issue in the first place, right? So um, at the top, you have, uh, can't see it right there, but at the top you have Fruit Igo um, that has a long history, documentaries on it. Um, as you can see, it's starkly different from the surrounding neighborhoods in and of themselves. You have Cabrini Green on the, on the top right, where in the background you have one of the taller, older buildings that used to be the character of Cabrini Green that were replaced by some of these short rise uh, mixed income communities as well. And then you have NYCHA in New York City, which is the largest housing authority um, in North America, which still has a lot of housing stock, but it tends to go through different types of ownership or management um, organizations, um, which typically have some type of benefit to the organization, whereby if they manage certain sites after a number amount of years, they can retain ownership of those sites due to their management um, portfolios. But when it comes to thinking about why these things are the way they are, there's also this kind of deep stigma that's tied to those housing units, right? And part of it is that in relation to the housing units themselves, we always kind of characterize or socially construct different identities for the people that are actually living there. So in this case, one of the, in terms of people living in public housing, right, a low income housing facility, there was also seen as uh, people that were being demonized for using any type of welfare programs. And we can couch housing assistance as one particular style of welfare um, in, a, in this context, but you had caricatures that were kind of demonizing people for um, abusing some social welfare, right? They weren't taking um, any benefits and they were kind of abusing the government systems in terms of policies and programs and services. So the welfare cream was a, a popular moniker, a popular caricature through the Reagan administration. And while a lot of people thought this was like a facade, there was actually some writing and uh, research um, done on the woman who this was made off of. So this was Linda Taylor, um, who was known as the welfare queen, and she was used and exploited as a caricature to, to illustrate or highlight all public housing residents and all people who want social welfare um, statuses. And at the same time, we get to more of this kind of neoliberal transition, right? Like the pirate sector can come in and do better with a lot of the needs that people have. It's also this kind of distancing from the role of the government and actually supplying housing, which is a contentious um, debate from the start of it that I'll get into in a little bit. But also this, it, it kind of gave some evidence, right? It, it kind of gave a scapegoat for people to think about why do we even have these programs in the first place? So even Reagan himself, he said in Chicago, they found a woman who holds the record. She used 80 names, 30 addresses, 15 telephone numbers to collect food stamps, social security veterans benefits were four, non-existent. Um, deceased veterans' husbands, as well as welfare. Her tax-free cash income alone has been running $150,000 a year, right? So she was used as the hallmark to say how can different people exploit the system. 
And then while we could think about this as a unique case, a lot of people thought that this was the general sense of people on any type of social welfare programs, particularly those who work um, within communities of color or people of color. So some work that a colleague of mine, um, Jason Rivera, who's actually at Buffalo State, right on the other side, um, close by, um, recently we published a paper in the Journal of Law and Inequality called Constructing Identities of Deservedness. And part of the reason we did this was that a lot of the talk about housing assistance and a big fear of mine is that because these kind of scapegoats, because it's this kind of discourse translates into how we think about policy and how we design policy, I'm worried that we'll still use these same type of maneuvers or techniques to discount all other types of housing assistance programs going forward. So part of the interest that we had was like, is this a newer frame of discourse or has this been at the start of public housing development? So what we did was we did a historical analysis of congressional testimony and um, uh, docu congressional documents and also newspaper articles to tease out that even at the start when they were developing housing policies in the 30s and the 40s, or uh, redeveloping it in the 40s, there was still some contention about the people that were actually gonna live there. So while this kind of, there was positive kind of constructions of veterans, there was definitely negative constructions of people who were not veterans or low income communities of color. Um, there was also positive constructions of farmers in and of themselves because they received a lot of benefits from some of these other kind of redevelopment programs. So in this kind of pivotal period at the end of the Great Recession around World War II, you get this sense that even when the, the United States committed to developing a national housing program, they kind of stepped away from it as soon as it was being begun, right? So you have this kind of national policy that in and of themselves gets undercut even at the, the beginning of its implementation. In the, in the kind of more modern sense, right, and this is just one scale I can use even more recent kind of newspaper articles, um, there's still this kind of idea that public housing serves at this like this lifelong refuge, right? And while we've, we've kind of uh, shifted to more kind of market-based uh, programs like vouchers, there's still this sense that public housing will never work in this sense. Um, and they use this idea as in New York, right? So as New York rents soar, public housing becomes a lifelong refuge. At the same time, it also depends who's in office, right? So there's this, this kind of political dimension where we think about who's actually in charge and who's targeting and what's their kind of belief and mission for those organizations. So even during the Trump administration, we had uh, Dr. Ben Carson, who had really no background in housing policy, but also had a lot of scapegoats and narratives and constructions about the reasons why people are living there. And it was even in his congressional testimony, he talked about people being too comfortable or becoming lazy in and of themselves, right? So we have this kind of undeservedness that peaks even with that Snyder and Ingram kind of construction that uh, the graph before, really thinking about this construction of who really deserves help from the government. So if we look at, and these numbers are as recent as December 31st, um, if we look at how long people are actually staying in public housing, just across different, very, a sample of different cities, um, it's, it's very mixed, right? So you'll get places like New York, where you have 68% of their population of public housing residents have lived there for over 10 years, right? And even if you think about mobility rates, there's a recent report from HUD, um, um, the Joint Center for Housing, and then most kind of mobility rates are typically for renters tend to be around five, four to five years. Um, but this is a long stretch of time. So it also thinks about how people are actually seeing this, this program, right? If it's supposed to be a temporary benefit, it also has a spatial and a social component whereby it becomes a permanent community, right? People are establishing ties in these communities. They're thinking about different ways to live their life. So there's a, there's a tension between how people are actually thinking about the program and using the program versus what policymakers tend to say they constructed the program to be in the first place. Um, but on the flip side, you have other cities like Chicago and Chicago has always been like a, a case study for kind of urban studies. But even when you think about housing policies, since it had so much to do with like Hope Six and a rental assistance demonstration programs and all these other kind of federal programs. Chicago is one of the places that tends to be that kind of site of what's really going on. So even in the case of Chicago, most of your population is living within public housing less than five years. And there are a number of reasons why, right? Some people are able to stay in there. Some people are transitioning out of, of how, off of housing assistance altogether. Some people are moving from public housing to another form of housing assistance, whether it be vouchers, or scattered site properties, or even sometimes senior living facilities where a lot of the bulk of the money in public housing funds is getting geared to. Um, and you have other places like San Juan, Puerto Rico, which still has a large percentage of people living in public housing, right? So it's not just confined to the 
the, you know, the mainland of the United States. It's also in our territories by which they also have housing authorities, um, but they don't have the same type of representation that we see in the U.S. government. But even if you look across the United States, it tends to be split. A lot of you have probably half your population living there below five years and another half um, or about uh, 53% or uh, 63% living, yeah, 53% living uh, there past the, the five year mark. So we do know that there's a global housing affordability crisis. It's not just in big cities, it's in smaller cities due to lower wages and a lack of housing supply. Um, but we know that in the U.S. specifically, more working households are increasingly likely to be renters. Um, many individuals are staying in public housing for a standard amount of times, and we see that's about 17% for people over 20 years. So the question becomes why that is the case. Do they see these as permanent sites until they you know, move on? Or they, do they see these as kind of, um, uh, is this becoming a lifelong refuge as some of the kind of mainstream media is putting it out there? Um, but then HUD has largely shifted away from public housing as a viable option, right? While you do have some cities that have large amounts of public housing, it's not the go-to for plenty of places, right? It's, it takes a lot of stock since there's backlogs of capital investment, there's backlogs of how we're lo actually looking at some of these spaces and actually um, doing repairs and maintenance. So a lot of people use vouchers as the unknown way, which we kind of have type, we can start to understand that this is just one tool in a toolkit, and we should be exploring the options for all of these different types of housing assistance programs as places become more unaffordable. So the research questions that kind of drive this, this study when I was starting my dissertation, and this work is published in, um, recently in City's Journal, um, it's like, to what extent do individual characteristics explain public housing exits, right? Is this just a cultural thing? Is it a cultural property argument? Is it this, is, is this something going on within the household? Um, does time spent in public housing have an effect on the odds of exiting, right? So the longer you live there, is there a duration dependence that you'll just stay there forever? And then we know in urban studies that the neighborhood becomes so important, but in different complicated and nuanced ways. So what, what is the relationship between neighborhood dynamics and public housing exits? So I won't go through all the literature just due to time, um, but we can kind of frame it. I kind of frame the, the poverty literature in these kind of three categories. One, you have this kind of camp that argues around individual attributes, right? And this dates back into uh, Michael Harrington's The Other America, the Monaghan Report, the case for a Negro family. You had Oscar Lewis in the cultural poverty thesis. And then you have even kind of more contemporary people like, and contemporary is loosely defined, but contemporary uh, um, public uh, scholars such as Charles Murray and like the bell curve, right? So this kind of eugenical like inferiority complex for different kind of racialized groups. Um, there's also this kind of, the, the kind of swing of the counter argument, it tends to be on these, uh, these structural conditions, right? So this, this is like the pretty much um, couched in the neighborhood effects literature. So you had uh, Bill Wilson stuff, you have um, my advisor, Paul Dragowski and the concentration of poverty. You have other scholars like Patrick Sharkey and that intergenerational uh, mobility of poverty. So there's, there's this kind of structural dimension that kind of counteracts those kind of individual attributes. Um, but within the middle, I would argue that there's this kind of efficacy or agency, because a lot of these, these, these arguments do take a lot of agency away from the actual individuals, even in the, the individual attributes kind of literature, that cultural poverty literature, it tends to be more reflexive between people and place, where there's like the agency, like, what if you actually ask people their actual mobility attention, and I'll get to some of that work in a little bit that we've done. With this particular topic, there's not that much research, right? Um, and then there's a number of reasons why there, there's data issues. Um, so I got interested in this work from Lance Freeman, who's a gentrification scholar um, at Columbia and his work on interpreting dynamics of public housing. Um, he used some of the data that I'm using in here and he argues similar kind of arguments, but I use it for an extended amount of time. He only did it for like a seven year period. Um, and then he has a follow up article, does housing assistance lead to dependency, right? Kind of counteracting some of the main discourse around this. And with, even within this frame, he kind of combines vouchers and other forms of uh, uh, public within the, the, the understanding of housing assistance with public housing um, to do his analysis. But we have to treat these things as mutually exclusive, right? Public housing functions very much differently than a housing voucher program. So I like to tease those out separately instead of combining those together. You have some economists like Hungerford who's looking at housing assistance spells, spells but he also used data from SIP, the Survey of Income and Program Participation. Um, and found some, didn't find a lot of duration dependence, but again, shorter amount of time during its duration. 
And then you have some others um, that were uh, Bachiva and Hoser. Look at just that New York City as an extreme case. Um, you had uh, uh, Scott Susan who looked at some HUD data and even uh, Kirk McClure where this that last paper was originally supposed to come out around the same time. So um, Kirk has a little bit better data, but runs into some of the, some of the same type of uh, descriptives that I do here, uh, aside from the neighborhood, which I think is my contribution to this understanding. Um, so for this particular project, I use data from the panel survey of income dynamics. This is one of the longest longitudinal studies in the world, established at the University of Michigan in 1968, um, and then one uh, annual survey, then went by anyone that after 97. For this analysis, I used uh, data from 1987 to 2011 for a few reasons. Um, I, I couched this kind of argument based on whether or not people lived in public housing. And the question that they asked uh, respondents to answer uh, started in 1968, but it wasn't picked up. It, it ended in 1973. Um, uh, so they didn't really pick up that question again until 1986. So I used uh, 1987 as a starting point to like look at heads of households or households to see who are living in um, uh, public housing from uh, 1987 to 2011. So the sample size is around 5,000 or 5,200 households. Um, and then I combine that with decennial data from 1990 and 2000 and then ACS five-year estimates. And what I do is because I'm really interested in those kind of neighborhood effects, those neighborhood dynamics, this allows me to tease out the household characteristics in conjunction or in relation with those neighborhood conditions as well. So you can have some, some type of relationship work there. The main variable interest is whether or not somebody exited from a public housing site. Um, and the, the other variables that I look at are housing spells. Some people have uh, noted that they have previous spells of living in public housing. There's a piece that um, gets covered that I do in another article in housing studies in terms of mobility intention. So I, they have a question to ask, like, do you think you're going to plan to leave in the next couple of years? And for a lot of people, they might that changes depending on the time frame. Um, policy reform error. So while we can treat these, I, I really like doing longitudinal studies. I think when you do a lot of snapshots, you miss out some of those kind of political or policy dimensions. Um, since this, this, this study runs from 1986 all the way to 2011, we know that in urban, urban studies literature that there was a lot of reforms in the 90s around housing assistance across the United States, um, particularly around like Hope Six developments and other kind of forms of housing assistance. So I used the, the year of pre- um, 1997 or post 1996 as a threshold to tease out whether or not people were moving more or less when there were more policies being implemented um, across the country. And now use some of your standard kind of individual characteristics for each household based on the head of household. The unique ones to point out around here is that I use children and dependents, right? So it's not just children living in a household. There's a lot of dependents. We know there's a lot of multi-generational households out there. There's also a question about disability status. And in this particular data set, they define it as a physical and nervous condition. And then we have the, the parental effects. And this gets at some of the, the work that kind of Sharkey, maybe not completely, but some of the work that Sharkey was talking about in his, in his work, right? So there's two ways. One is your perception of your income growing up. So they actually ask heads of households, what is your perception of your income? Were you poor? Were you rich? Did it vary? Um, but also, what was the structure of your household? Did you live in a single family household, dual parent household, or some other types, um, whether it was like a foster home or something like that? And then I use some of the kind of housing market kind of um, characteristics or conditions, right? Vacancy rate, gross rent, household income, poverty rate, and unemployment. Those are categorized at the neighborhood level. Um, won't talk too much about the methodology, but for descriptives, I, I use uh, a Kaplan Meyer estimate. So this is the probability of somebody exiting based on the up to that point in time. And then I use a multivariate analysis, particularly an event history analysis. Um, and I'll be using odds ratios just to interpret them. But what this allows me to do is to track people while they're in this sample, right? So if you come in in 1996 and you leave at 2000, you're in the sample for four years versus somebody who's in there from 1986 to all the way to two. 2011, right? It allows me to treat them as individual kind of uh, lengths of time. The reason, this is another reason I have a paper in a social science journal that really thinks about this kind of issue of thinking about poverty spells through snapshots versus longitudinal. And it's because it'll give you different kind of pictures of like where people are at in their trajectory, right? And we know that like tenure or housing tenure um, is a, a very complicated thing. And when you're ever studying a family, they have very different dynamics of how long they've been living in that place. And that time there may kind of condition on why they have 
lower or higher um, intentions to move overall. So there are some limitations, right? There's, we know there, there's some housing authority influence here. There's some previous observed spells. There are some specific, specific reasons for exits, whether it's demolitions or even evictions that's been more highlighted in housing. I can't do that here, but I have done some other kind of methodological things to tease out. We can get into some of that stuff in the Q&A. So this is what a typical kaplan meyer survival curve looks like, right? So the odds of exiting at year one is 100%. But what we see here is that the, the probability of, of living in uh, public housing um, or the probability of exiting public housing uh, tends to drop drastically within your first five years, right? So if you're going to have these type of mobility issues um, or if, you're, if the whole goal is to drive them to other forms of housing, that probability of them actually leaving public housing after five years um, uh, drops drastically, right? And another reason that during this time when I really started this research, the, even the Obama, uh, the Obama administration was really thinking about putting term limits on public housing, where a lot of your other social welfare programs have term limits, public housing does it. So that makes it a, a very much kind of unique social welfare program. Within the literature of urban poverty, we also know there are big differences between kind of sex, right? So like how do women and men or males and females fare differently in this, in this space? And we do see um, men exit at a faster rate than their female counterparts, right? And this is in line with the literature, because even if you think about a lot of the literature around urban poverty, it tends to focus on female-headed households, particularly in communities of color. And lastly, even if you think about it in terms of like the racial dynamics, and this was really interesting to me, because if you look at the literature, it's always couched as this like issue among communities of colors. But even if you look here, the probability of exit among black and white households is almost the same, right, across the, this data. The only difference is that white households exit at around year 14. So while there's a, a, a greater propensity for kind of white house to exit, there's also a greater propensity for black holes to last in this, in this particular sample, at least. Now, when we think about, and this is just a snapshot of like the final kind of model, I use a, a, a ton of different models to kind of tease this out. And what does this really tell us? Well, one, we know and if on the left side, you see, um, the odds of exiting public housing decrease the longer somebody stays in public housing, right? And that, that's reflected in those kaplan meyer exit uh, uh, graphs. But also that reform variable was really interesting, right? So you had a 95%, the odds of exiting um, public housing were 95% higher um, in the post-1996 era versus the pre-96 era or pre-97 era. And what that, that tells me is that based on what we know about policy, a lot of these other policy decisions were driving exits. It wasn't just the households themselves. It wasn't just the neighborhoods themselves. It was the actual time period in which we're looking at. And that, what I would allude that to or connect that to is policy decisions around um, time limits and term limits and shifts to other housing assistance programs. In terms of individual effects, we see that uh, age does have a, a positive effect on odds of exiting different racialized groups, which is a small portion of this particular sample, but it also is also to note. Um, other marital st statuses, right? And this was defined as separated, widowed, or divorced, had a higher odds of exit. But even income didn't really have a strong statistical um, exit. And you would think like the more money somebody makes, the greater the odds of them actually leaving public housing. But that wasn't the case, at least in this, in this data. And then lastly, the neighborhood literature was really interesting to me is that you kind of have these two tales of the, the tales of the two sides of the neighborhoods, right? The higher the um, household income of a neighborhood, the higher the probability exit, but also the higher the poverty rate, the higher the pro probability exit. And what is that really telling us? To me, it might be, it's plausible that people in higher income neighborhoods are receiving some type of amenities or opportunities or resources within those spaces. Um, and it also could be that poverty is usually an indicator from other different types of poly, if I connect this to the reform variable, it also might be that even in kind of lower income communities, there's higher rates of exit for a number of reasons, right? Maybe these units are being targeted for specific policy interventions. Maybe there's specific issues within those neighborhoods around the connection between poverty and crime. We don't know this. We can't be causal on these exclamations, but these are some plausible suggestions based on other, other studies that have been done. In terms of the mobility piece as well, right? Um, when you actually ask some people, and this is another, this is the study in, how, in housing studies that was picked up by the Urban Institute and Housing Matters, um, when you move, uh, if you actually ask people about their mobility intentions, their mobility intentions tend to overlap in terms of their actual exit rates up until around year four, right? So while people that want to move, they have a slightly larger probability of moving from five years on, 
um, versus the other ones, but even up into that point. So it, it still takes some time for people to get on to uh, in the position to actually relocate. And I think that's the piece where we're thinking about term limits. Well, if we're considering those, what is the appropriate amount of time for people to actually get what they need so they can move it to another housing? So what are the policy implications? We know there's several, right? Um, and I'll finish up sh shortly, but more equitable development in all cities. There's, there's this kind of piece on self-sufficiency that we kind of need to discount versus really shifting to residential stability. Uh, we do need a diverse portfolio of housing tenure options. Public housing is not gonna solve the issue. Vouchers are not gonna solve the issues of unaffordability. And then for, for a lot of the work, it needs to be context specific. We have a lot of tools, but they need to be connected to the actual places in which people are living. So what about Canada? So Toronto remains one of the most severely unaffordable cities in the world. And a lot of us are experiencing this, we know this, um, and we still see a lot of development around the city, but not for the populations that we would typically try to advocate for. At the same time, there's some questions about what Canada can learn from the US on housing affordability. And we, we, we still are in that kind of debate of whether they're learning anything um, compared to the states. As a result, there are kind of like, you know, main uh, policy programs or policy initiatives such as housing TO, they're kind of action plan. And with a big focus on different frames of housing, while I do like the frame, there's some, there's some critique that has been or whether this goes far enough. And particularly we're looking in the kind of social housing context here. And then while even a lot of even residents within um, TCHC have argued like this doesn't do enough, right? So like housing TO, um, is not about this space in terms of like really doing enough for residents here. Um, it is not, and then it's also like debate or whether or not is there like, this is not connected to Toronto community housing because there is a, a stigma that still uh, exists within the housing authorities here um, in, in the city. So just a quick recap, um, Toronto, social housing in the, in, the, in the context of Canada has been around for a long time, around the, since the 1930s. Toronto, Toronto Community Housing Corporation was created in 2002. Um, prior to 1998, there were three municipally owned and operated affordable housing developers. And after 98, uh, the premier, Mike Harris, reorganized the provincial government, whereby housing shifted way more from uh, a multi-level um, federal, uh, provincial, and local issue way down to a more uh, as a local issue. Um, so you have this kind of amalgamation of the what was formerly the Metropolitan Toronto Community Housing uh, Corporation and a Toronto uh, Housing Company, um, where uh, Metro dealt with the managing of public provincial public housing, while Toronto did a merger between some of the nonprofit and local affordable housing complex. Um, but soon to come, as I was just made note uh, recently, um, Toronto Community Housing will be shifting into two entities: one de dedicated to focus on family housing, and another to specifically look at senior housing. Um, and then just to give you some de kind of demographics, there's very diverse kind of portfolio of people living in there. The part of that kind of uh, the separation is that there's about 28% of their population is seniors. Um, there's a lot of people living in different types of buildings and even some of their uh, seniors are living in more family style housing. So they're thinking about what does this shift actually look like? A lot of the units that TCAC has are high rise units, right? So getting back to that, some of that kind of architecture that wasn't the immediate design of some of the US housing sites. Um, but even about 29% of the tenants actually live alone, right? So there's, there, while there are a lot of families, there are a lot of, there are also a, a sizable amount of um, single family uh, individuals living in households. And their, their distribution across the city is very wide, right? So there, there are sites, all across uh, the GTA region, um, which are operated into what we call operating units. So each letter is indicative of an operating unit, um, whereby they have certain kind of staffs and facilities that uh, dictate their maintenance and repairs, but also deal with um, tenant resources and tenant issues as well. So why even study Canada? Like, what, Why should we care about this other than like, we're all living here at this point? Um, it's more so that, that when we think about given the urban housing crisis, it, housing assistance still serves as a temporary form. You don't have this until you pass away. This is very much still a temporary form of program, right? So if you don't meet the standards for these programs, there's some issues why. Um, there's a lot of neighborhood effects to literature it tends to be focused on US cities. Um, a lot of the literature on public housing tends to be focused on US urban planning and their racialized history of housing policy. 
And then I also would argue that, you know, a lot of times we idealize progressive countries without kind of having empirical evidence to determine whether or not their policies actually work. So the research questions for this are to what extent are housing assistance programs clustered in disadvantaged neighborhoods? And that disadvantage did the count was like, the neighborhood context in here is not the same as the US when we talk about disadvantages, um, because we have a different social welfare network or political system that people are actually operating with. Um, are there relationships between program type and neighborhood conditions, right? So you have social housing, you have co-ops, you have senior living facilities. Are they clustered in particular types of neighborhoods? Um, race is not a not a, a, a indicator by which a lot of kind of administrators actually discuss, but it comes up in some of the more recent surveys, right? So does Toronto's colorblind approach to housing assistance result in greater neighborhood diversity among households? And does neighborhood context even matter? So due to time, I'm going to, instead of going over the literature review, I think you kind of get a sense, I'm going to consider the actual analysis. So starting in 2019, I've been collecting data, administrative data from TCHC, which is, aside from New York, is the second largest housing authority in North, in North America. In North America. Um, for this first kind of primary or preliminary results, I looked at family versus senior units and using their household IDs. We just got, just got the email two weeks ago um, from Aaron to like match people across time. So I'll have data from 2002 all the way up to 2021. Um, so I can kind of do a similar analysis up here. And then for the kind of neighborhood piece, I'm looking at Canadian census data from 2016 and pairing that with some of the dissemination areas um, versus census tracts, right? And looking at some of these other pieces. The one interesting piece that's unique up here compared to the, the states is this kind of black visible minority population. So that's more of a inclusive term to be used versus others. Um, this is one part of a bigger study. I just got uh, a shirt grant to do more qualitative work, uh, following up on some of this uh, quantitative and spatial work. Um, that's going to be getting this summer once I get through these classes this semester. Um, so here's just a distribution of the different types of programs that we see, co-ops, family, senior, contracted units, and those are what it's kind of like um, uh, kind of like how light tech or low income housing tax credit units work here, where they're contracting out the management to a private or a nonprofit developer or organization. When you think about do they have access to different public transportation, this was another interest between Emmeline and myself. You do see that a lot of the units do have some access, and then you see those kind of dotted lines or bus routes. So they're not um, further or they're not extremely isolated from some type of form of public transportation as compared to a lot of the, the housing units that are in the states. And lastly, when you kind of think about uh, the clustering of these, 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 these actual units, um, we look at the kind of black, excuse me one second, uh, the black minority population and rent, right? So on the x-axis is the proportion of black visible minority populations and also rent on the, on the, on the x and y with the percent of um, visible minorities. And what we do see is that family units on the lower end of rents tend to have be in neighborhoods or dissemination areas with higher proportions of your black visible part, uh, minority population. But as the rent becomes increasing, increases, you have um, lower amounts of families and seniors within those spaces um, uh, of, of neighborhoods or dissemination or higher rents, right? So there is still some like type of clustering where you have them in kind of less diverse neighborhoods of higher income. The same can be said um, in terms of income and dissemination areas, you see a similar relationship. And also home values, right? So you have these kind of stark pieces within that and that space where you see these kind of um, clustering, but not the same type of clustering that we see in the States. And what are the major takeaways? Well, one, family and senior developments tend to have better proximity to public transit versus co-ops and contracted housing sites. Uh, family developments tend to be in dissemination areas with high percentage of Black visible minorities, as I just said, with lower median rents, median household incomes, and median property values, right? So that, that, causes, that causes us to think about, do, does that even matter in the first place, whether or not you're in a lower income community with higher um, diversity? Um, but the difference is less significant on the upper end of the scales. Both family and senior developments are within DAs with lower percentages of black visible minorities, right? So where are the overall lessons that we could take away from this? Finishing up, neighborhood context is a proxy for quality of life, right? So we do see, in, in, um, however, social wealth, fair policies mitigate their long-term effects, right? 
So neighborhoods matter, but it also depends on what is the broader political or policy system in which you're operating, right? Do people have access to free healthcare? Do they have access to some of the other free education or some of the other kind of benefits of different other countries? Um, more so, most research focused on mobility outcomes tend to accept neighborhood conditions as a causal explanation without, while still relieving the role of public and private institutions and in shaping neighborhood disadvantage, right? So neighborhoods are not static, they change. Um, for better or for worse, but there are decision makers behind those changes. People are deciding whether or not investment goes in particular neighborhoods versus other ones. Housing assistance is a very contentious issue, right? It still decides this big idea of whether or not people deserve to have housing assistance, whether or not the federal government or even local government should be in the business of providing housing for those less fortunate or on the lower on lower income scales. Um, but it's just one tool, right? We have rent control, we have shared equity mortgages, we have community land trusts. And none of these in, in isolation solve the urban housing crisis. But if we can think about kind of collective or collaborations or combining some of these programs, we can mitigate some of these issues. Um, and lastly, racial composition, not just a mechanism for understanding disparities, but also the construction of those narratives and public policy making and producing urban and social inequalities more broadly, right? So even in some of the work I've been doing to have this kind of uh, question about who, did, who gets what program and why, it's really interesting when you look at some of the congressional testimony and some of the debates that are going on that focuses on the individual rather the problem itself. And a lot of the decisions that are driven by policy tends to reproduce or reconstruct those problems in different ways for different groups. So race, race and racial composition and racism become a deciding factor in how we think about these programs, particularly in the U.S. But even I would argue in the, in the context of Canada and some of their kind of racialized histories within housing. And I went a little bit over time, but I'd like to thank you all. And I look forward to having um, some Q&A all of you with the time left. Great, thank you so much, Professor Dantzler for that fascinating presentation. Um, as we move into our Q&A period, I would just like to remind everyone uh, that they can put their questions in the chat or raise their hands. Um, and I can call upon you to unmute yourself and ask your question. So while we get started with that, I can uh, kick off our discussion with a question for you. So uh, Professor Dantzler, you touched a little bit upon the identity production that was constructed to characterize and stigmatize those on social supports. So how can we work to address and challenge the negative opinions and perspectives on social housing as well as its recipients, especially considering that these attitudes are often present and reflected in policy decisions, as well as by political actors and political leaders, which aid in reinforcing those harmful stereotypes. So how, yeah. can, how can we fix this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think part of it is that and this, it, it, this gets into the kind of U.S. politics a little bit, but the part of the issue I see is that, um, you know, Democrats have a very, do a very poor job of like framing issues versus like focusing or re responding to Republican um, talking points, right? And I think this comes in context where a lot of, even when you think about the Obama administration, part of the, like the um, choice neighborhood or promise community or promise neighborhood uh, kind of initiatives, were to think about communities and neighborhoods versus individuals and of themselves. And I think, for a lot of us, when we're in this kind of urban space, when we focus on place versus the actual people that live there without thinking about, right, without constructing kind of negative construction of those peoples, that gets us to think about what types of policies that we're actually acting um, for that. And I think if you look at some of the data around kind of affordability crisis, this is not unique to low income populations. Whether or not what class or income bracket you're looking at, a lot of people are spending absorbent amounts of housing costs, whether it's 30 to 50%, the threshold used to be a threshold that typically we look at is 30% for how um, homes that are cost burden, but even middle income and upper income families are spending 50 or 60 or 70% on housing costs, right? So I think by framing the issue as one that affects us all and not as like indicative of one smaller population, you get a better sense of how to describe policies that may be a little bit more politically feasible in the short term versus and the long term going forward. Great, thank you. Um, we can move to Alicia Eads, who has her hand up. She would like to unmute yourself. So, um, hi, Francis. Thanks so much for this talk. This is really interesting. Um, my, sorry. So, my question I had while you were presenting, but then, but then, what you just said about the fact that housing affordability is an issue for increasingly 
people higher up on the income distribution. Um, it just sort of highlights my, my question further, which is I can understand why some policymakers would want people to move out of public housing, but why would people who have like, I mean, particularly in the US and Canada where there isn't much public housing, why would people who in at least some sense have been lucky enough to make it into public housing, why would they want to move out of it in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the reasons are vast, right? So particularly in a case we see that even in the literature, right? A lot of, depending on the public housing site, it could be in a neighbor, neighborhood that has other forms of disadvantage, right? High crime rates, high displacement, no access to other resources, whether it's schools or, or health facilities or hospitals. Um, these were segregated communities and built as such, right? And uh, even when we're thinking about the redevelopment processes or the revitalization, revitalization projects that go on in cities, a lot of times they're not geared or targeted towards the communities in which they need, right? So the, while the site itself, right, you have a secure place to live, if you're furthering distancing yourself from any other type of resource in many the city, then you have to think about what's the better case. Do you move to another neighborhood and, right, and strip some of your ties that you've built over that lifetime? Or do you just live in a neighborhood and just commute to everything, right? And depending on that kind of family dynamic, I think those issues become way more debatable at the kitchen table versus like how policymakers are actually thinking about them in and of themselves. The other piece to that, I think there, that also alludes to whether or not it's a voluntary thing, right? And I think there's a the involuntary piece that's really interesting to me where depending on the city, you have higher or lower levels of the actual housing authority being one of the main evictors of people um, in the city, right? And this, this was a case where there was a student that did a research project in Cincinnati and found that Cincinnati's housing authority had high levels of eviction versus kind of private market landlords. And that calls us into question, right? Because of that local influence that I'm really interested in, how different housing authorities kind of um, uh, migrate or deal with this issue. I do think some like New York City tend to like, hey, you can live there as long as you want to, where others like Atlanta, in conjunction with some of the redevelopment programs that were happening in the late, in the early and late 90s, are like, no, you have to move to another unit, or you have to move out of side of public housing altogether and go to a voucher or some type of other housing assistance, right? So, right? so I think the crux of that answer is that one, on one side, you do have some type of voluntary approach where people are making decisions based on what meets the needs of their household. But you also have that involuntary piece that's not captured in the study, but we know that people are being pushed out and not by their own decision. They, if they could, they would rather stay there for the long term. And they would rather have some of the amenities that they were ignored or were ignored for their communities for, you know, decades at this point. That's great. Thank you. Um, to move on to a to next question, uh, as I'm sure you know, our current housing policy and programs such as, uh, you know, subsidies and tax exemptions, they often cater to and, and promote home ownership. Uh, which is just not attainable for for everyone, um, and this is present uh, in the landscape of uh, of our housing crisis um, in the backdrop of a global pandemic that has significantly and, and disproportionately affected uh, lower income populations and and our renter populations. So, what can be done to increase the opportunities and availability of supports from our government uh, for these vulnerable groups? Yeah, I think one piece is like. Uh, when you looked at the funding in U.S. over the years of how much actually goes to subsidizing home ownership versus housing assistance program, all housing assistance program, the number is like somewhere between like 10 or 11 to 1, right? So we highly promote home ownership as a, as a reason. And part of what I was doing in a, that kind of book chapter and even other work is to promote this idea that this home ownership is directly tied and notions of home ownership are directly and ideologically tied to notions of citizenship, Right. To be a good American is to be a homeowner, is to have a family, is to buy a home, is to move up socially and economically, where for a lot of people, that's never going to be the case, right? Like a lot of people, wages have been stagnant for a long time. Some people don't want to buy. And even if they could, they can't buy in the markets that they're actually operating in. Um, the other flip side is that I think we, we, I don't know how to do this, right? But I'm hopeful that we have a, a, a big ideologically shift of how we're thinking about homeownership, right? It's not the primary form a way that people wish, but like I said, one tool in a toolkit by which you could really think about um, residential stability. And I think this kind of shift, of, like homeownership is tied to these notions of self-sufficiency where I would like a conceptual shift to residential stability because that allows for different forms of housing tenure to be placed in those areas, right? You can have a community land trust in that space. You could have 
a rental facility, a long-term rental facility. You could have different types um, of uh, uh, non-market or even market rate rentals um, within different spaces and think about that as a holistic housing system and, and, and counter to driving everybody to buy a home. And having been a homeowner, having been a landlord, still being a landlord, these are not things that people want to deal with on an everyday basis, right? It's a lot of work. If something breaks, it would be nice to call a landlord, at least a responsible landlord that's going to get it fixed. So I think the notions of how we think about homeownership is, as uh, Ann Schley would say, are we overselling it? Has it been oversold? Therefore, particularly for low-income populations that don't may not have the discretionary income to deal with maintenance and repairs and a relocation, then we, we need to kind of think about what other forms of housing can we provide for all people whereby they can have some type of stability, whether it's like rent control in this city. So, yeah. Great. Incredible. Thank you. Um, Ellen Berry, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for this talk. So interesting to hear about this. And I really appreciate the, you know, bringing in the two national contexts. Um, I have more, I think, of a comment than a question, but uh, one of, it's more about the meaning making that's gone on you know, by public housing authorities, by city governments um, uh, to sort of justify these changes. And my experience more with this is in the US context where in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was living in Chicago. And it's always, as you say, you know, you have to be cautious about generalizing from Chicago, but it's really devastating as an even just an outsider seeing Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor, these huge communities and buildings getting torn down and kind of the awful consequences for the people in the communities that were there. And you talked in the talk about this rhetoric of kind of stigmatizing the welfare queen. And I, as I understood it, like I felt like that had kind of dropped by the wayside in this time period. And really what was elevated was this neoliberal language of failed government. The government yeah. had mismanaged these buildings and that was kind of on the one hand. And then the other hand, I like really picking up the language, I think, from sociologist William Julius Wilson about mm -hmm. the problem of a concentration of poverty and how right. that creates these dysfunctional communities. And so, and this is all happening in the context of, you know, massive gentrification and just like the land grab by developers. And it was so obvious so that, that that was going on to any kind of objective observer. Um, mm -hmm. And then from that came this language of, oh, we need mixed income communities, not concentrated poverty. We need home ownership, not stuck in, you know, these decrepit buildings. And so to me, that, that like, I know that's not as easy to test in the model, but that is like this yeah. important piece of how the US housing policy got to where it is. Yeah, I agree. I think I think there's there's elements of a little bit of both of that, but even a little bit more too. I think part of, and this is also, as you noted, this kind of shift where kind of mixed in community, communities, even over the last decade have been like that, that hallmark of what everybody aspires to be. And I think there's, there's this kind of, I think, I was talking to Richard Oseo, who's writing a book, um, and thinking about this this concept of diversity ideology that's kind of prescribed in that, right? But even in those kind of language of mixed income communities, it tends to be very much focused on class, right? And I think part of my issue with how we, we kind of describe housing policy, or even when we think about housing policy, or these the disruptions of community, is that race tends to be this like indicator of uh, inequality without this construction of how we do these things in the first place, right? And I think that's the piece where you could have clustering of low-income communities, and that may not be any problems in those communities, right? Like, they may just be low-income. They have, still have some, some, some uh, proximity to different resources, and that's why I think the neighborhood piece is where we, you know, in urban, we are always focused on the neighborhood and all these kind of disadvantages within that. But if you think about a different policy system by which people are actually living under, it's a different way of kind of understanding that neighborhood over well. And even kind of anecdotally, the reason I got into this work is that when Philadelphia was kind of redeveloping through Hope Six Money, a lot of the public housing sites there, the, bit, the first question I asked is like, so where do all the people go, right? And I think as we're redeveloping a lot of these kind of housing programs, the, the, the point I always come up and I bring in all my classes is that there's always going to be this politics of intervention. And for a lot of these spaces, the people who are already disadvantaged or who are already marginalized are going to bear the brunt of these changes that a lot of people like us want to see. So I think when we're thinking about this kind of like, how do we actually have like more equitable, responsive um, and inclusive how, like policies, particularly in the housing space, we have to confront these issues that race and class are kind of uh, mutually dependent in a lot of these contexts, but also the ways in which we kind of think about communities and with the ways we need to think about housing has to be totally erratically different, right? It, and I think 
for the issue that we have, right, is that we just know wealth creation is pretty much driven by home ownership or property ownership in the, in the United States context and other contexts as well. So you have to think about getting people to really think about if that's the best way going forward, because if not, you're still getting these battles of people fighting for land and land grabbing and all this other stuff as, as we see in other processes like deconcentration of poverty, gentrification, segregation, and so on and so forth. So for me, it's, it's really kind of thinking about differently, thinking differently about how we can create an equitable housing system. And no, I don't have like the frame of like what that really looks like, but I do think we need to tease out some better options and highlight some of the other programs and policies that have worked in other places and test them out in our own local communities to see if they do a good job at providing more housing. Um, Karen and I have talked about this before, but one of the issues I, I see here is just preservation of existing housing, right? So you have all this housing development going on, but there's not a preservation of existing housing, particularly for lower income families happening in conjunction, right? So while I do think Canada is progressing in some spaces, I do think it's falling behind and not learning enough from some of the, 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 the tensions and the issues that the United States has had over, uh, over decades. Great, thank you. Uh, so as we get, uh, or as we're approaching one o'clock, we have time for one quick question. Uh, Neil Davis, if you'd like to close us out. All right, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Dansler. It's good to see you. <laughs> Neil Davis. This is one of my former uh, graduate students at uh, Georgia State, so it's so good to see him. <laughs> Hey, I wanted to say that this was uh, this was really impressive. And um, one of the things that, that, you know, as soon as you started talking about um, what happens to those people, you know, I think this is something that that entire conversation of missing middle housing tends mm -hmm. to miss. You know, they people people don't realize how they are literally tied to those the have nots, you know, and it's like, what are we doing with with this housing? You know, they just, especially here in Atlanta, they just destroy it, you know, and it's, they don't, a lot of people don't recognize your missing middle exists right there. You know, you are, you are literally tied to them because the haves, they're going to do whatever they want. You know, just, I, I think your, your graph definitely illustrated that it's like, Hey, once you hit that point, they can do whatever they want. The, the rest of that fight is there. So it's like, Hey, how do we, how do we get people to, to shift that, that, missing middle this this push for missing middle policy to really tie into uh what we what we put in place for the people that are in essence just being pushed out i mean that that is a huge huge key at this point especially here in yeah America. yeah it's great to see you know um and i think this is the piece that i argue particularly on the urban poverty regardless of the kind of institution that we're talking about right i think we we tend to treat people's lifestyles or their their, their life courses as very much an upward linear motion, right? Like you go to school, you get a job, you get a better job, you make more money and you do this and you make more money. Where I think about people like my dad who's a bartender, I'm like, my dad's rate and his income is going to be pretty much the same until he retires and pass away, right? So I think while we're, we're on this kind of trajectories of always thinking of like upward economic mobility, that's not the case for a lot of people. And we know this from how we look at wages, how we think about the difference between wages and housing costs. That's not typically the case. Um, and on the front side, I think there's a lot of people who are kind of questioning whether or not we should be tying in or buying into this American dream in the first place, right? I think for a lot of people um, like myself and others, it's just like, why do I want to own a house in the first place? Um, is there something else that I should be buying? Is there something else that I should be investing my money in? What if I just want to be more mobile as somebody who's moved like three, four or five times in the last seven years, right? Um, having a house also doesn't create that kind of opportunity that a lot of people see it also can be you know, a disadvantage when you're trying to do other things. So I think we've couched it in this way where a lot of, you know, number one way people have created wealth in this country is home ownership, but it's also very problematic. And I'll end on this. I think the last piece, and I'm probably said this in your, in, to your group as well, is that the two kind of most complicated people to think about in terms of change is, is parents and homeowners, right? Because they're gonna argue to whatever end to one, protect their wealth asset, but also to protect their children. And I think when you couch that in that, you also think about how individualistic we are and when the housing market is really kind of produced and constructed in that way, can we think about more community-based kind of approaches, more community development approaches, which tie us together intentionally and not thinking about it as, as in conflict with one another. And that's why I would like to see more kind of shared equity mortgage. I would like to see more kind of shared ownership opportunities or co-ops for different people. So we can think about different ways to actually just provide housing overall and not only put it on home ownership as the driving force or the driving goal for the United States or even a Canadian context.
Great, thank you. This has been an amazing discussion today. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up, uh, but I'd like to thank Professor Dantzler for his insightful presentation and everyone in the audience for your attention and participation. I think that the knowledge sharing and translation of today has been extremely valuable. Um, if you enjoyed today's session and would like to participate in our future events, the next seminar for our Knowledge Cafe series is called Training in Education for Climate Resilience with Professor Karen Smith. Um, and will take place on Wednesday, January 26th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And for more details, you can visit our website at schoolofcities.com events to register. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.